Sometimes we think of New Zealand as having no history, but that is because, as Tolstoy says, happiness has no history, contentment has no history. History, generally, is the story of the cruelties, the stupidities, and misfortunes of mankind. And we've had some of those, uh, certainly. We've had uh, factional struggles. We've had land wars in the North Island. We've had uh, class uh, struggles, overseas wars in which uh, we've fought, of course. But we have had a history, and our history has been chiefly the heroic, silent struggle uh, against the land itself, and the struggle to build a new, decent society in this new country, and to turn the howling wilderness which the pioneers confronted in the middle of the 19th century into the prosperous, smiling land which New Zealand is today. There have been injustices along the way, injustices to all sorts of people, not just brown ones, but we have persevered, and Māori and their descendants have benefited immensely from the peace, law, inventions, plants and animals, intelligence, labour and civilization of the pioneers. We have a great little country here, because these labours, the blood and sweat of the pioneers, these have created the true title deeds to our country. We have a priceless, egalitarian society. We have a wonderful artefact of mind and body. We have a triumph of civilization. When in the history of the world, when and where, has there ever been a better place to live for ordinary people than New Zealand has been for most of its history, and certainly since the, since the Second World War, which is the period that I know, we have lived in one of the rare golden ages of human history. And we are throwing this all away. A self-serving treaty industry, obsessed with, obsessed, I don't wish to sound like the Prime Minister, obsessed <laughs> with, with the, with the self-enrichment of corporate iwi, obsessed <coughs> with racial distinction, that can only tear us apart if it is allowed to continue. I mean, for a generation, we have been following racial policies which have not even been successful on their own terms. For the last generation, race relations have steadily deteriorated, public prosperity has declined, and the position of those of Maori descent has not improved. As we all know, Maori are vastly overrepresented in all the wrong statistics. Illiteracy, poverty, crime, domestic violence, child abuse, substance abuse, prison population, poor health, short lifespan, every statistic you can think of. What New Zealand has been subjected to is some bizarre variant of the trickle-down theory. We give money to Maori elites and it trickles down to solving Maori social problems. And how much evidence, how much more evidence do we need that this simply has not worked? And I might ask also the question, how much gratitude have we received for our undoubted generosity at all? None at all, simply complaints that it is not enough. At the time of the 1998 Naitahu settlement, for example, uh, there were public statements by some Naitahu leaders that it was not a just settlement, that a just settlement would require $20 billion to be paid to Naitahu, and that anything less than that was not justice, and of course this is laying the ground for another claim at some time in the future. I have never heard a successful uh, uh, treaty claimant say thank you. <laughs> and I think that even if in a grudging sort of way, that would be appropriate. Unlike certain cynical Maori leaders and treatiists who find it convenient to have a big pool of disadvantaged Maori whom they can claim to represent, unlike them, I am genuinely concerned about Maori poverty. But the way to solve poverty is by dealing with poverty. It is not by dealing with something completely different and hoping that poverty will somehow be miraculously solved in the process. The treaty now is debilitating 15% of New Zealand's population and profoundly irritating most of the other 85%. The treaty industry is debilitating to Māori themselves. So Aparan and Ngata long ago recognised the awful danger to Māori of dependency. And we recognise the immense potential which Māori have to be as good as everyone else. But they will not achieve that as long as they are cast as eternal victims and eternal parasites. Now, I'm often asked, I'm coming to the end of my remarks, ladies and gentlemen, I'm often asked, whom should we blame for the uh, present unhappy uh, uh, state of affairs? Well, 
I don't think we should blame Maori activists themselves. After all, all they're doing is asking us to you know, give them uh, more, and there's no harm in asking. And as long as we are stupid enough to keep giving them more, they would be, they would be stupid not to ask, uh, ask, ask for more. So I can't blame them. Politicians, well, they are unprepossessing, spineless, and largely untalented who do ignore their promises when they, when they can get away with it. Uh, it's hard to believe that National campaigned uh, in the last two election campaigns uh, on the promise of ending racial separatism. But nevertheless, we still do live in a democracy of sorts, and ultimately uh, politicians do more or less what we want them to, or at the very least what we let them get away with. I would blame the brain, brainless news media uh, who feed us a diet of pap and crime and trivia and celebrity and shock horror and gossip and largely ignore a careful investigation of any serious issue. And I have no time for the arrogant caste of liberals, the arrogant intolerant caste of liberals who have largely taken over the bureaucracy and the education system. But nevertheless, in the last resort, I have to say that we have to blame ourselves. Not actually you, ladies and gentlemen, present in this room, and not me. We're concerned, but our fellow New Zealanders, I'm afraid, are just too apathetic, too innocent, too trusting, just too plain nice uh, to be concerned about this. Uh, I remember, you've seen The World's Fastest Indian, that lovely little film which came out some years ago, old Bert Munro uh, going off to the United States to win various motorcycle championships. It was a lovely little film, but it did irritate me because it did promote... What was that? I don't know. It did promote a, a pernicious myth uh, about human life uh, and about New Zealand life in particular. Here was dear old Bert, lovely old gentleman, innocent and trusting, goes to the United States, knows nothing at all, and no one took advantage of him. Well, perhaps it was actually like that in Bert's case, but nevertheless, life is not always like that. Most of the time, it's not. And it seemed that, that the message of that film seemed to me to be pernicious because it uh, promoted the completely incorrect myth that as long as you are nice to other people, they will be nice to you. And I'm sorry to say that that is not true. And certainly it is not a rule by which we should conduct our public life. A far wiser rule for the conduct of our public life uh, is the advice which my great-great-uncle Frank, who was a lawyer as it happened, uh, gave to my great-grandmother when he said to her, if you trust anyone, Minnie, you're simple. <laughs> and certainly... <laughs> And certainly that should be the rule of our public life. We're too nice a people. Uh, and, and this is sometimes justified on the ground of Christian principle, but that's nonsense because, as if I may quote sacred scripture to you, Jesus said somewhere in the New Testament, he said uh, that we should be as innocent as doves, but as wise as serpents. That we should be innocent and good, yes, but we shouldn't be stupid. Uh, we, we should be good, but that doesn't mean that we should be gullible and believe every hard luck story that every con man with a convincing smile comes along and tries to spin to us. The tr and I think this is the fundamental flaw uh, in the New Zealand character. It's a, it's a beautiful flaw. Uh, there couldn't be a nicer one. It does us great credit that this is our, our flaw as a people. But uh, we are too comfortable and too cosseted, too far away from the buffets of the world in this new country and these far-off islands. We've lost our understanding of human history and human nature. It, it, I think it's inevitably the New Zealand, uh, the New Zealand flaw, because our country was conceived in innocence. That our dream from the days of the pioneers has been to make a country which was better uh, than the country we came from. Where we wanted to make a country which was purified and cleansed of the imperfections of the old world. We were born in innocence and hope, and so we are too trusting and too nice. We're like our native birds which were so much at ease uh, over the millennia that they lost the power of flight and, in consequence, were defenceless uh, when a new wave of predators came along. We've got no sense of history, and we assume that the happy state uh, which we enjoy here is the natural order of things and will go on without any effort at all on our part. And we've forgotten that civilization is only created by a lot of hard work, physical labor, and also mental discipline also, and that without a culture of virtue, uh, it will decline. 
Now, everything changes, ladies and gentlemen. That's the first rule of history, the first rule of human life. Everything changes, sometimes for the better, often for the worse. We in New Zealand, as I say, we are fortunate, we have been fortunate to live in one of history's rare golden ages. But it is coming to an end, as all good things do. Dark times, I am sure, are in store for the world. Climate change, overpopulation, diminishing resources, famine, disease, war. We haven't defeated these, and already we can see them returning. And in these demanding times which are coming, we need to be as strong, as determined, as prepared, as unified in purpose as we can be to meet these challenges. And yet we are heading in the opposite direction. We should be looking forward and we're looking backwards. I really think that our country is standing at a crossroads. The bogus constitutional discussion of the last couple of years, if it had succeeded, would have fatally hijacked us. It would have set us irrevocably on the path to destruction. Now, we've headed that off, at least for the time being, but the same forces are still out there. The issue is a stealthy one. It doesn't leap out at us like uh, over the cost of housing or of some pressing uh, economic issue or, or what have you. It's, it, it creeps up on us stealthily like the water which is gradually coming to the boil as the innocent little frog sits in it. And so the frog, we all know the, the metaphor, the frog is boiled to death because it doesn't notice that the water is gradually getting warmer and warmer. And that, then it's curtains for the frog. It's an issue that creeps up on us. It's not as immediate it has other issues, but in the long term it is a much bigger issue. It's issues like this which in the long run make or break nations. And although we still do have time uh, to take the better way, time is running out. We're so comfortable and so safe that we forget the lessons of history. We forget that nations can fail and that from time to time they do. And we're so used to our reputation as the social laboratory of the world that we seem to have forgotten that not all laboratory experiments succeed. <laughs> and we have been so bewitched or so intimidated by the mis mysterious treaty that it never seems to have occurred to our rulers and leaders uh, that any policy attributed to that magical document uh, might not necessarily uh, have the happiest consequences. The treaty itself offers no magical guarantee that anything done in its name will bring only blessings. Nations can fail and they can be brought to ruin by policies entered into with the highest motives. Indeed, it could be argued that they are more likely than not to be brought to ruin by policies entered into with the highest motives. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Our history has not been without injustices, although they are often exaggerated. But whatever justification there might have been in the past for treaty claims, the treaty industry is now the self-perpetuating vehicle by which a small, greedy, power-hungry clique practices a gigantic con job on the people of New Zealand. It is long past time that we shake ourselves free from the baleful spell which the treaty has cast upon our nation and calmly and clearly assess the good and ill it has actually done. Look at where we are and where we might be going. The time is here when we have to make a national issue of the question of whether we are going to be a racially divided, apartheid, doomed state, or whether we are going to have one law for all in this country.